We are back and we are joined now by Murtaza Hussein, reporter at The Intercept, who had a, a, a piece that came out last week with a friend of the show, Ryan Grimm, entitled Elon Musk's Twitter widens its censorship of Modi's critics. Murtaza, thanks so much for coming on. I really love your work. Well, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so interesting that free speech warrior Elon Musk, who uh, acquired Twitter for $44 billion because he believes in the principles of free speech, might be working with a fascist to uh, w on his aggressive censorship efforts. I mean, shocking. Shocking to hear that, right? <laughs> yeah, Elon Musk, when he took over Twitter and in the run up to that, he had a lot of uh, very idealistic rhetoric that he uh, put forward as to what his motivations were. It never really seemed too sincere to me, but I think we're seeing now in the way Twitter is actually being run is that he is not very committed to free speech. Uh, he's willing to maybe indulge a few pet causes. And I think one he's particularly interested in is the rights of conservative speech in the United States. But Twitter is a global company and, you know, there are countries all over the world where Twitter is very important and millions of people use it. And his commitment to actually upholding free speech in where it really matters in instances of government repression in countries which are not perfectly democratic or undemocratic or authoritarian, it's really been lacking. And, and I think one thing we've seen recently is that Twitter India, under the previous ownership, it had a lot of pressure from the Modi government, which it resisted. Uh, but now that Elon has taken power, uh, he's fired a lot of the staff in that office. And we're seeing a much more cooperation and you could say control of Twitter by the Indian government during a period where democracy seems to be backsliding in that country. Well, let's let's give people some context then on that democratic uh, backslide, if you don't mind, Murtaza, because uh, a lot of people would be familiar with Narendra Modi, I'm sure uh, this audience is. Uh, but but he's come. When did he come to power? 2014? Is that yeah, that's right. So he came to power after many, many years of the Congress Party being in power in India, which is a more uh, establishment liberal party of India. People had a lot of complaints with that party for reasons, some of which were understandable, but patronage and corruption and so forth. Uh, and he's at the helm of a rival party called the BJP, which is a religious nationalist party. Yeah, uh, it's much more Hindu nationalist. Right yeah, Hindu nationalist party. Yeah, it's much more right wing and so forth. And you know. Modi had a very checkered background before he became a uh, leader of the country. He was actually prohibited from entering the United States for some time uh, due to his involvement in human rights abuses and uh, some massacres and riots that took place in India in a state which he was governor uh, some years before. But now he's prime minister and he is certainly changing India in many, many ways. And one way we're seeing is a crackdown on minorities and uh, liberal civil society groups, crackdowns and consolidations of the press. So India is democracy, which existed for about 70 years. Uh, it's certainly degrading and becoming something quite different. And you see a lot of outcry about this from international human rights groups, the press and so forth. And, you know, I would say from the perspective of a social media company that, you know, if the ostensible goal or ostensible reason for purchasing of Twitter by Elon Musk's part was to further a liberal ideal like free speech, uh, you certainly need to resist a bit. The attempts by authoritarian or quasi-authoritarian governments to crush that. And instead, we're seeing, unfortunately, Twitter acting more and more as a handmaiden to the Indian government in the trajectory in which it's going at the moment. And uh, the trajectory is, yes, censorship as well, but censorship that aids um, Modi's essentially political discrimination and crackdown of rights for minor minority groups, particularly mu Muslim citizens uh, in w within India. I mean, 200 million Muslims live in India, but they are still a minority and are actively being um, discriminated against. I mean, th th Modi has used this tactic many times, right? It, I think most notoriously recently in Kashmir, where he was immensely aggressive in censorship uh, shutting off the 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 internet for a long period of time, and that's obviously a majority uh, Muslim state. Um, how how much of this is uh, instrumental or foundational for Modi's politics and his rule over India? Censorship as a tool to maintain the power of the the groups that uh, of the majority that that 
he's kind of representing here? Uh, one thing people usually don't know uh, is that uh, India actually leads the world in internet shutdowns of this type, which you're referring to, which took place in Kashmir. And m most of it, a lot of it has been targeted, as you said, against uh, Indian Muslims, who are a very, very large minority, but still a minority in India. You know, 200, 250 million people, something like that. But lately, and what we saw last week, is that this shutdown actually targeted a different province, which was not Muslim majority, it's actually a Sikh majority province, or plurality, uh, Punjab. And Punjab is was a site of a separatist movement in the 1980s. Uh, it was an insurgency at that time in Punjab. And there is some dissatisfaction or unhappiness among many Sikh Punjabis with the Indian government for various reasons to this day. There's a gentleman whom the Indian government is trying to detain. He's a popular Sikh preacher. And the response was to shut down the internet in this province during that time. I think about 27 million people live there. By Indian standards, it's a small province, but you know, by global standards, it's a pretty big number of people. It's almost a population of an entire country like Canada. So, you know, the internet was shut down. Uh, people were not able to do SMS communications, many, many other things, all to catch one guy, ostensibly. And then during this time, a lot of uh, global social media accounts commenting on the subject were withheld in India at the request of the Indian government to Twitter. So what you saw, unfortunately, was a shutdown of people's ability to communicate with friends and family, uh, to operate normally in an entire gigantic province full of people. And, you know, all in the sense of, uh, you know, cracking down on, you could call free speech. And maybe you don't like his speech, of you can accuse it of being separatist or something like that, this gentleman who they're trying to catch. But, you know, if a company has a commitment to free speech and the grave thing that means, it means including all types of political speech, uh, including uh, political speech, which certain governments where you operate don't like. So, you know, I think that this is part and parcel of the change in Indian government. And if you're operating there as a company, you need to be ready to um, draw a line with what you're morally standing for or not. I think there's been a lot of pressure on companies operating in China in the last couple of years for reasons which are understandable and somewhat comparable to India. But now the question is not only being asked in India at the moment, even though we're seeing uh, some evidence of crackdowns, which are on the spectrum, which uh, you may see in more authoritarian countries. Um, what is particularly going on in Punjab, uh, Punjab right now? That um, is it? Is it just the the search for uh, this kind of nationalist leader, or um, are, what are some of the political realities on the ground that they're also trying to tamp down? Yeah, so as I alluded to earlier, in the 1980s, there was a major insurgency in Punjab by Sikh separatist groups who wanted to create a separate country called Khalistan out of India. So, you know, obviously many people know India used to be one much bigger country and Pakistan was part of that and Bangladesh was part of that. And there was the separation happened when the British left on religious grounds. So Hindus and Muslims sort of got separate states to some degree, although many Muslims still live in India. Now Sikhs were left out of that, and they always wanted to have a separate state. Many of them want to have a separate state in without Punjab. And when they tried to do that in the 80s, and they did it by taking up arms, many of them, the government responded very violently. There were a terrible crackdown. There was a attack and bombing of their holy sites and so forth. And there are pogroms in other parts of India against Sikh Indians uh, because of these events and because of a later assassination of an Indian prime minister by her Sikh bodyguards. It was a big, terrible situation that took place. The Indian government put it down very forcefully. They don't want to see anything like that happen again. And most states, you kind of understandably, they're very, uh, you can be very authoritarian towards perceived threats to their sovereignty or their territorial integrity. And we certainly saw that in India in the 80s. And because they're so afraid of that happening again, too, they're quite aggressive against any expression of ostensible or possible separatism among Sikhs today in Punjab. They've tried to co-opt certain Sikhs that they can uh, into the Indian government military. Those who are not reconcilable or those who are quite committed to a separate homeland or those who feel oppressed or discriminated against by uh, Indian government with their minorities, uh, they're considered enemies. So now, mm. to the extent such a movement exists today, and you see it events in this gentleman, his name is Amir Paul Singh, who's still on the run, uh, and his supporters who still are also on the run in Punjab, it's an 
evidence of the Indian government's continued fear and uh, paranoia about the subject. And you know, states often overreact uh, to the threats like this. They often over overreact sometimes with brutality. And you certainly want to not encourage that. And you don't want to enable that uh, when it seems to be taking place. Yes. And um, I know I'll return to the, the Twitter angle um, in a second. I just I'm trying to understand the full scope of this. How much of this also has to do with some of the protests by farmers groups because of um, what Modi has been doing in his time in power, which is like attempting to deregulate and privatize these sectors? So you can think of the Indian government, the BJP government, it's like a very neoliberal government in a way. It's neoliberal economically. Uh, its approach to identity, you could say, is also neoliberal in many ways. So it's India is a country which is built in 70 years. It had like a socialist sort of founding. And because of that, there's a big sediment of subsidies and you know allotments, which were kind of set up to keep the various, many, many diverse groups of India satisfied in certain ways. One could argue that not all these are efficient and maybe some, if in the interest of neoliberalism, they should be removed. I think there are many people in the Indian government which have that view. And, but, you know, it's, it's going to antagonize people when you do that. And secondly, there's also a perception of crony capitalism on behalf of Modi and people around him. So in the, uh, two years ago, there in, in Punjab, there, were big, there was a big protest movement uh, it was about water rights and you know dissemination of water between Punjab and their neighbor across Haryana, and people you know there's went on strike. They took up the roads and so forth, and they actually did succeed in getting concessions out of the Indian government, partly because many people in Punjab are relatively well off, landowners and so forth. They have some political clout as a result of that. So the Indian government did concede, but I think that it was alarming to them in some ways because. It was still an expression of political power and uh, assertiveness on the part people in a part of the country who have a history of uh, many of them have a history of having some desire for their own homeland. So I think it made them nervous and they're certainly not going to tolerate or they'll be on guard against further expressions of political assertiveness in Punjab. Um, and I think we're seeing that today. So, so you know, I, I think they conceded with the farmers protest, but they didn't like it. They didn't like to concede. They don't like seeing that. And I think in India too, uh, generally speaking, the provinces which are minority, majority minority, they tend to experience more, if not hostility from the government, at the very least suspicion. And that gotcha. suspicion can often translate into kind of harsh measures in response. So with Elon Musk and his new kind of gutted Twitter working with uh, Narendra Modi and uh, his police state efforts or his repression efforts, I mean, what is your sense of why that uh, coordination is happening? Is it purely because uh, I, India is a massive market for Twitter, one of their top five, I believe? Or is there anything else at play here? Well, you know, I tend to have a policy of uh, not assuming malice when I can explain it with incompetence. So my, <laughs> first, uh, my first gut feeling is that Elon Musk took over the company. He made a very bad purchase. He paid, overpaid. He immediately started firing people without much forethought beforehand. He fired a lot of Twitter India staff. Whether he knew or didn't know beforehand that Twitter India was under a lot of pressure from the Indian government, including threats of arrest due to not uh, enforcing their some of their ban uh, orders on certain accounts. I'm not sure if he knew that or not. But certainly gutting the staff seemed to have made the, that branch of Twitter much more permeable to Indian government influence. And now we're seeing that Twitter India is almost acting as like, you know, a supporter of the Indian government actively and certainly acceding very easily to their demands, which have great political consequences. So that's the incompetence uh, explanation. The malice explanation, if there one were to think of one in terms of Elon Musk, is that he has big business interests in India and he has, you know, he wants to expand there. He's tried to expand there for some years. And because India has a lot of governmental controls and investment and so forth, you kind of need to have a good relationship with the Indian government to do that. Whether he wants to burn those bridges as India becomes a bigger and bigger market, uh, I don't know if he wanted to do that. I don't know if Twitter free speech is really worth it to him for that. So it could be that he either is turning a blind eye or enabling this change in Twitter India enforcement because he has interest there. And I think it's not an implausible explanation. We tried to get him to talk about it, to ask, answer questions about it. Unfortunately, it wasn't amenable to that. 
If you contact Twitter's press office today, uh, it's a poop emoji that the automatic response you get. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You set it up that way. So I think that uh, it kind of gives you a sense of how much he's really interested in transparency about Twitter, which, you know, one way or another, it's a very, very important communications platform for people all over. Yes. So I'm just trying to clarify this. So when you reach out for comment, the, the auto reply is a poop emoji. Yeah, it's a poop emoji. He said he was going to do that and he set it up. So now press.twitter, whatever the, the generic email is, gives you a poop emoji back. So to get, you know, comment from Twitter now, this shows you how much the staff has been gutted. You kind of have to tweet at Elon Musk and maybe you'll respond. He sort of commented on a previous story we did on Indian suppression, uh, Twitter India suppression indirectly by saying he's really busy and he's focused on other stuff so he didn't know about it that's what that was our quote from it but there's no formal process which i think stan speaks to a broader problem with what's happened with twitter now is that a very big important telecommunications piece of infrastructure basically yeah. he went and gutted the infrastructure of it of the staffing and so forth and now it's functioning in this hollowed out zombie kind of shell which maybe to us we can get by with, but if you're living in a country which is authoritarian or a country which has authoritarian practices, which is the case in parts of India at the moment, uh, the implications of that can be quite dire. Absolutely. I mean, this guy, he's a child. It's like, it's just absolutely yeah, yeah. Who he's runs a company? Funny either, so he's not very charismatic or funny, even though he's trying very, very hard. So one he's thing you can buy is funny. He's trying incredibly hard, uh, which is uh, which is just what's so depressing about it. Um, yeah. Uh, last thoughts here. I mean, you mentioned China, but China does have their own kind of analogs to some of these social media companies, which makes it a little bit different. Um, is the the is are there any efforts that you see in India to circumvent some of the more like U.S. based Silicon Valley? Uh, tech platforms or is it more just now modi's gonna be like we're open for business and elon's a right winger i'm a right winger we can make a business relationship work you know it's very very interesting uh there's a lot of company countries in the world which would like to uh put the toothpaste back in the tube when it comes to opening up the internet and the way they did uh, such as allowing these global platforms and free flow of information it can be very damaging to very controlled authoritarian systems um, China, very uniquely among countries in the world, when the internet was starting up, they created this big firewall, the great firewall that they created, uh, very with great foresight, you know, in a way that they want to control the internet. They built their own very robust and capacious and influential domestic internet, and that exists there today. For India to do that, it would take a lot of work to do that, and you know, a lot of resources to very uncertain effect, and you would have to to get everyone off these old channels and onto new ones. I think it'd be very difficult for them to do that right now. Other countries which are far more authoritarian and far more at odds with the US, like Iran, they also, in their view, the Iranian government suffers from uh, the free flow of people getting on VPNs to go on Twitter and so forth. They try to create their own domestic internet to support that. I think even for them, it's very difficult. Uh, for India, which has a lot more they want a relationship with the West. It has wants investment and wants an open, relatively open society in some ways. For them to do that would be very difficult. So I think that it'll be hard for them to actually make their own internet with firewalls. I think what they would like to do more is to bend the existing internet more to their own liking as their government policies change. And part of that will entail getting companies like Twitter to enforce rules on their terms. Murtaza Hussein, reporter at The Intercept. Uh, the latest piece is entitled Elon Musk's uh, Twitter Widens Its Censorship of Modi's Critics. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Of course.